So we are very pleased to have uh, Sim KT back with us, and he's going to continue uh, to take us through the wisdom series from the book of Proverbs. Today, he's going to speak on uh, the four relationships, God, family, uh, friends, and the world. So he's going to continue also in the next two weeks with us as well. Now, Katie known, is known to us as a Bible teacher and also a writer of the our Daily Bread series, uh, Ministries. He has written um, a number of uh, articles for the Discovery series on the Bible study guides, uh, Journey Through the Series Devotional, and Insights for Our Daily Bread. He has uh, so far written two books, and journeys through the series on Ruth, which of course is a beautiful book on uh, love and redemption, and also another book, Footprints on Calvary Road, uh, Walking with Jesus on the Cross. He tells us that he's got two more books coming up for this year. Uh, the first one coming up in March 2020 this year uh, is the I Am Sayings of Jesus in the Gospel of John. And towards the third quarter of this year, he's going to publish Journey Through the Series on 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Okay? So, Katie, welcome back to uh, Calvary Chapel. The floor is yours. Good morning. We are into the last stretch of the pandemic <laughs> measures. Uh, our PM has already indicated that the last portion of the measures will go. I think that's probably he's referring to the mask. Okay. Uh, we look towards the day when uh, we can actually safely unmask. Okay. Some of us still wear the mask. I still do because I got vulnerable people in my house. And because I'm itinerant, I go to <laughs> different churches every week. I don't know where I'm going to catch the bug. <laughs> so... Uh, for health reasons, for medical reasons, we will continue to keep the mask on. Now, research has shown that we make an eye-popping 35,000 decisions every day. So today, you will make about 35,000 decisions. And some of you may have already made hundreds of decisions, like what to wear this morning and whether to come to church or not. And in fact, it is also found that in a typical day, you will make about 230 decisions just concerning what to eat. What to eat, whether you want to eat this or that for a day. The book of Proverbs is a compass that helps us to navigate the many decisions that we have to make in life, pointing us to the right direction and helping us to make good and wise decisions. Living wisely is the theme of this book of Proverbs. Wisdom in Proverbs, as we look at it last year in July, means that you have attained certain skills in living life. Wisdom is actually skills in living life in a way that honors God. And therefore, the wise person in the book of Proverbs, is also the godly person. A wise person is one who knows God, trusts God, and follow God's ways. So keep that in mind of the definition of wisdom when you read the book of Proverbs. Now, last July, we did a series of three sermons or three studies on the book of Proverbs. Uh, we, we did the PDL, the Proverbs Driven Life, for those of you who who were, who, were, who were here and then we, we say wow you know watch our words and then we look at PAP you know uh, prosperity and priority not, not, the, not, not the political party but prosperity and priority issues that deals with our life now as we begin a new year we want to seek wisdom from God's word to help us live a wise life or a godly life and Oops. Okay. And we are going to look at 
what Proverbs has to say about the three fundamental three relationships that we have in our life. Okay, we look at life relationship, and this morning we look at fundamental relationship of God, family, friends, and the world. Next week we will look at our relationship with our work, where we consider labor, loafers, and leisure. And on the third Sunday, we will look at our relationship with the other half of the world, women. Wayward woman, wonderful wife. So our focus would be on relationship. A major component of life is our relationships, our interaction with other human beings. And today, we look at how we interact with people in this basic relationship of family of God, family, friends, and the world. Proverbs deal with the most basic relationship we have. Our spiritual vertical relationship God with God is also the most important. And the, there are a number of things that Proverbs tell us to do in respect to our relationship with God. But we want to look at it in three areas. Fear God, trust God, honor God. Now, to be wise or to live godly life, we need to start right. And we need to fear the Lord. Because this is the basis for living the godly life, the holy life. And the basic principle is stated at the beginning of Proverbs in Proverbs 1.7, where it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and fools, or rather, ungodly people despise wisdom and instruction. And this basic requirement to fear God is restated in somewhere in chapter 9, verse 10 again. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. I've given uh, the Bible verses so that you can in your own time look at it and study it because in a sermon, uh, uh, you don't have much time to really meditate on, the, on those verses. So please take note of the Bible verses and look at it. For this seg for, for this sub, sub sub segment. Now to live a godly life, you need to fear the Lord. That is the most fundamental requirement of life. Now, what does it mean to fear the Lord? To fear the Lord means to respect Him for who He is, and it comes up with a various. Uh, it can be broken down in various verbs: worship, trust, obey. Sir, fear can be broken down in various other verbs. Worship Him, trust Him, obey Him, and serve Him. And therefore, as we think of ours, as we begin this new year, let's get our relationship with God on the right footing. To fear the Lord means to acknowledge that everything you have, who you are, what you have, everything comes from the Lord. In Proverbs 14, 16, in Proverbs 14, 16, the wise fear the Lord. It is, a, it, is a, it is an affirmative statement. The godly fear the Lord because they understand that everything under the sun is under God's rule and in God's control. God is sovereign in our lives. The wise fear the Lord. Proverbs 14, 16. In Proverbs 8, 13, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. Here we have another facet of what it means to fear the Lord. To fear the Lord in Proverbs 8, 13 is to hate evil. And Proverbs 16, 6 affirm that 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 stands, that position that we are to take when we fear the Lord. In Proverbs 16, 6, reading from the New Living Translation, by fearing the Lord, people avoid evil. So if you want to live a holy life, you want to live a godly life, you want to live a good life, 
fear the Lord. The fear of God does not come to us automatically. We need to cultivate it. We need to cultivate it. Moses reminds us that to know, to fear God, we must know, understand, and keep God's law. <clears throat> In addressing the new generation of Israelites about to enter the promised land, Moses told the Israelites this in Deuteronomy 31 verse 12. In Deuteronomy 31 verse 12, Moses says, call them all together. Uh, God, God told them, God told Moses to do this. Call them all together, men, women, children, so that they may hear this book of instruction and learn to fear the Lord your God and carefully obey all the terms of this instruction. Verse 13, do this so that your children who have, known, who have not known these instructions will hear them and will learn to fear the Lord your God. Twice, twice God told Moses that he must continue to teach God's word because it's only when you know God's word, you know how to fear God. And that goes back to, that, that that's the question. How much of your time are you going to spend learning, studying, reading God's word? this year. Because without that effort, you're not going to learn, you're not going to learn or you're not going to know how to fear God. Because it is the word of God that give us instructions, that give us instructions to teach us to learn to fear the Lord. So, question now is, how much time are you going to spend in reading, studying, meditating on God's word this year? Because the fear of the Lord depends on this exercise. The fear of the Lord depends on this exercise. You are building your fundamental relationship with God. You are building your love for the Lord. There is a reason why we must love the Bible. We must read the Bible. Because God's word is given to us not only to help us fear the Lord, but also to trust the Lord. In Proverbs 22, 17, Solomon tells us to pay attention and turn your ear to the sayings of the wise. Apply your heart to what I teach. For what? For it is pleasing when you keep them in your heart and have all of them ready on your lips. In verse 19, so that your trust may be in the Lord, I teach you today, even you. Now, Proverbs 22, 17 is very clear why we need to read God's word. First, it is because it is fundamental to fearing God. And secondly, knowing God's word will help you build your trust in God. You will know God better and you know you can trust Him. So that your trust may be in the Lord. I teach you today, even you. And we are to keep God's word in our heart and on our lips. This call to trust God is fundamental to the godly life. And, and we all quote this in Proverbs 3.5 all the time. In Proverbs 3.5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him and you will make your path straight. This year will be challenging. The headwinds are coming. Economic, financial headwinds, political headwinds. Okay, social headwinds. And whether the winds are going to topple you depends on how strongly you are rooted in the word of God. How strongly you are rooted in your trust for God. Now, in honoring God, in trusting God, there is actually a caveat. There will be times when you don't understand God's will. 
there will be times when things seem all wrong. You have honored God, you have, you, you have feared God, you have trusted God, and things are not going right for you. And 2023 may, may, be, may be like that for you. Maybe in 2022, you're already facing that. And you are asking, what's the use of fearing God and trusting God when things are not going right for me? Well, the book of Job addresses that issue. But Isaiah 55 verse 8 reminds us that God's thoughts are not our thoughts, neither His ways are our ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And this is where not only fearing God must stay put, all the more trusting God must stay put. Okay, It is in those times that when we don't understand life's perplexities and life's misfortunes that will strike us this year, life's pain that we have to go through, when we don't make sense of it, that we are even more to trust God. And there's only one simple reason why we have to do that. Because He's trustworthy. He's trustworthy. Our human abilities and our human intelligence are never enough to get us through. It is never enough. Because we can never trust in our own cleverness. Proverbs 3, 7 in the New Living Translation, I like the way New Living Translation render Proverbs 3, 7. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Okay, Some of you have very high IQ. You have a PhD. Okay? And, and, or you, uh, or you, uh, you have a postgraduate degree and you do very well. And you are impressed with your own cleverness and your own wisdom. That's the starting point of failure. No matter how clever you think you are, don't be impressed with your own Wisdom. Simply reason, Paul gives us the reason for the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. And so for all of us who wants to enter into 2023 on the right footing, fear God, trust God. Trusting God, therefore, does not guarantee that your life will be easy. It is not a formula for an easy life. Neither is it a guarantee that you will live a trouble-free life. But when you trust, fear God and you trust God, you will be making the right decisions about life. And you will be able to live a life that pleases God. Fear God, trust God, honor the Lord. That's just the third thing that we must do in our fundamental relationship with God. Honor the Lord in Proverbs 3 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops. Then your buns will be filled with overflowing, and your beds will brim over with new wine. We honor God when we demonstrate this fear, this trust in God despite the circumstances, and, and we honor God by giving him the best of what we have or what we have been given. So this is the third area of our life that we need to do. We need to work on giving our very best to the Lord because that's the way we honor him. We show our gratitude for his provisions and we acknowledge that he's the source of everything, which goes back to the definition of fearing God. To fear God is to acknowledge that he's sovereign. It is also a way to show that we are good stewards of all that he has entrusted to us. Our basic, our fundamental relationship is vertical. And we need to get that right as we begin the new year. Our vertical relationship with God will therefore impact all our horizontal relationships in this world. When we are right with God, we will be right 
with others. Proverbs deal with relationship in the three spheres of our life on the horizontal basis. Our home, our friends, and the world. The three realms of horizontal relationship, our family, our friends, and the world. And we want to look at the second most important relationship, which is the family relationship, that of parents and children. And we will look at husband and wife in our last study, okay, in our third week when we, we studied the book of Proverbs. God gave parents, particularly the fathers, the privilege and the responsibility to teach the children about God. God wants godly offsprings. Offsprings who know Him, who fear Him, who trust Him, and who honor Him. If you look at the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 1 to chapter 9, takes the structure or the form of a father teaching his son how to live godly lives. Okay? The instructions in Proverbs chapter 1 to chapter 9 is the advice of a father to his children on how to live wisely. In Proverbs 1.8, listen, my son, to your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. And therefore, Proverbs 1.8 sets the teaching educational environment for the home. The father's instruction, the mother teaching the children, both parents, father and mother, educating and enabling the children to face the world. We'll look at this in a short while. Okay. Therefore, we need, if you are a parent, you need to pay careful attention to how you bring up your children in the fear of the Lord. Our children need to hear instruction from you on how to fear and honor God. Parents do not have to try to teach their young systematic theology. You don't take out a, a Bible doctrine book and say, son, read. Parents just need to live out your life. And that is systematic theology for your children. Monkey see, monkey do. You don't need to send your children to additional supplementary Bible teaching class. Although I know some of us still do that. Send them to BSF. Send them to uh, children's camp. It's a good thing. But this should not be placed on your life. How you live your life. Because your children see you, see how you fear God, see how you trust God, see how you honor God, and they learn. As parents, we exert influence on children in four ways. Our attitudes, our actions our words and our works. Get our attitude right, get our actions right, get our words right, and get our works right, and the children will follow. We must do the talk. And also we must walk the talk. What is the greatest legacy that you can give to your children? You know, as a parent, I provide for my children through insurances, through other financial instruments, so that when I pass on, they will be able to, you know, inherit some property. But is living physical inheritance the, the best way to 
to endow our parents, our children. I want to suggest to you that our greatest legacy to our children is our fear of the Lord. What? If you have not passed on your fear of the Lord to the children, then there is, you need to really relook at how you live your life. In Proverbs 14, 23, uh, 26, in Proverbs 14, 26, whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress. And for the children, it, it, it will be a refuge. Look at what for, Proverbs 14, 26 says. If you fear the Lord, you have a secure fortress, you have a solid in solid legacy there. And and why? What did Proverbs 14 26 says your children will take refuge in it? The fear of the Lord, the legacy you build for your children. If you look at in the New Living Translation, New Living Translation uh have Render it this way. Those who fear the Lord are secure. He will be a refuge for the children. He, you, will be a refuge for the children. But on another level, He, capital H-E, will be a refuge for your children. That's the legacy, the greatest legacy that you can leave behind for your children, not your house, not your bungalow, not your car, not your saving accounts, but, the, but your fear of the Lord. You see, as parents, we strive, we strive very hard to bring up our children to fear the Lord. And the most famous passage that speaks about this is Proverbs 22, 6. As a parent, you would have heard of this instruction in Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child. Train up a child. That's the ESV. In the NIV, start children off on the way they should go. And even when they are old, they will not turn from it. The New Living Translation tells us to direct your children on the right path. And when they are older, they will not leave it. Now, the few years with your children a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. You will realize that they, they grow up very fast. Okay, It was not too long ago when I, I visited my daughter and I saw my granddaughter on, the, on, 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 on her first day of birth. When she came. She's now a five-year-old running around. Five years has passed. In other words, I'm five years older. And you are already five years older. You need to understand that the opportunity that you have is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And once passed, you cannot get it back. You cannot relieve it. It is a life-shaping opportunity. If you are a grandparent, you have, and the, you have the opportunity to to live a spiritual heritage and legacy for your grandchildren. Once your children grow up, in those 5, 10 years, 12 years, once they hit primary 6, you will have missed the opportunity to shape their values and to set the direction in which you want them to go. If you have young children or grand, young grandchildren, this is the time to make a lifelong and eternal impact on their lives. For there is more at stake for your child than just getting into the best schools and into the best sports and into the best jobs. Because each child has an eternal destiny. There is a final destination, the destination, an eternal destination for your child, for your grandchild, and you must set them on the road. You know, as parents, we if, if I'm a lawyer, for example, I want to set my children on the path of legal profession. Right? That, that's, that's how we, we dream dreams for our children. And 
we need to dream dreams for our children that my child, your grandchild, has got a final destination, which is heaven. Are you going to set him on that road to heaven? That is the question of Proverbs 22, 6. Set a child in the direction in which he is to go. And where is he supposed to go? To heaven. Set your child in that road to heaven. Train up a child or start children off in the way you should go in the New Living Translation. God has called all of us, parents, grandparents, to train up the children to fear Him, to trust Him, to honor Him. That's the way in which your child is to go. Your duty is to get your child into heaven. Your duty as grandparents is to get your grandchildren into heaven. You know, the word, the Hebrew word train or start, hanak, means to dedicate. It has the idea of dedicating or devoting an object to a deity. You know, when I was younger, my grandmother dedicated to some Chinese gods in the temple. Okay? Anak or train up has this idea of you dedicating your children to your God. What are you doing in life as you parent, as you grandparent your children and your great uh, and your grandchildren? An important part of raising children is the need to discipline your children. Why is there a need to protect, to discipline children? Proverbs 22, 15, folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it away. Or in the New Living Translation, a youngster's heart is filled with foolishness, but physical discipline will drive it away. Underline the word physical discipline. Spare the rod and spoil the child is a modern proverb, but it is actually very ancient wisdom. Discipline, Proverbs 19.18, discipline your children while there is hope, otherwise you will ruin their lives. Now, I know that modern parents have a different philosophy when it comes to using physical discipline. Okay, My daughter, don't use the cane on her daughter. Okay, my granddaughter has been spared the physical discipline. It's a different philosophy altogether. We, the, the research is that it might scar that child emotionally if you use the physical punishment. But whatever your views are, scripture talks about physical discipline. Okay, And I'm just we, as parents, as grandparents, you need to learn to balance between modern psychological theories and what the Word of God says about physical punishment. And we have to come to a conclusion and how we want to train up our children. Okay? Train your child because you love them if you are into training, not because you are angry. Sometimes parents cane their children because of disappointment. They didn't get the A plus that you wanted anymore her to get. Yeah. Wrong. You cane them if you are you believe in caning because <clears throat> you love them. And 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 Proverbs 23, verse 13 again reminds us: do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish them with the rod, they will not die. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Okay. As if Proverbs is telling us that, you know, we don't want to scar them for life. Okay. Punish them with the rod and save them from death. I believe in physical discipline. Although I don't have the in throughout my life, I don't have the opportunity to exercise it on my children. Okay. But if there's a need to, you need to decide whether you want to use it or not. 
Proverbs 29.15 is another reminder. A rod, a physical rod, huh? and a reprimand imparts wisdom. But a child left undisciplined disgraces his, his mother. I'm sure you have this experience when you are at a restaurant, okay, eating, and the children are running wild. And the children almost topple the food that the waiters are carrying. And instead of scolding the child, they scold the waiter for not watching out for the children. I think the rod is necessary at times. Because of our fear of physical, the, the, the impact of, the emotional impact or the psychological impact of physical caning, we stop caning altogether. Something for us to think about. And Hebrews chapter 12 talks about discipline. Okay. Again, scripture is full of instruction for us to seriously talk about, think about disciplining our children as part of our parental responsibility. So we have looked at relationship, responsibility of parent to children. Let's look at responsibility of children to parents and that's where we are. We are always somebody's children. Okay, Even if you are 70, you are somebody's child. And if your mother, your parents are still alive, they will probably be in the 90s. You are still somebody's child. And you have responsibilities. And Proverbs present two duties that, or rather, I want to look at two duties. Oops, sorry. Back, can you go back to the other one? Thank you. First of all, when the child is living in the home with you, The children's fear of life is his home. The child has to obey his parents. In Proverbs 23, 22, from the Living Translation, listen to your father who give you life and don't despise your mother when she's old. Get the truth and never sell it. Also get wisdom, discipline and good judgment. Can you imagine this? The three phrases there, wisdom, discipline and good judgment. The father of godly children has cause for joy. What a pleasure to have children who are wise or who are godly. So give your father and mother joy. May she who gave you birth be happy. The question therefore you have to ask yourself, all of us are adults now. Are your parents happy with you? <clears throat> are your parents happy with you? You know, in life we sometimes have a strange relationship with our parents. Okay, at some point in life, you, you walk out on your parents or your parents walk out on you. But our relationship, our duty as children to parents continues on because you are born into that family. No matter how strange or difficult the circumstances are, the duty of the child to obey the parent in the home. But this duty to obey parents does not last forever. And that's where all of us are now. Okay, We have grown up, we have got married, we are parents ourselves, and we have moved out of the house. We have moved out of our paternal house. We are, we are a family unit. How do I relate to my mother who don't live with me now? or to your father who don't live with you, with you now. When you are young, when you are a child, you obey your parents. Right now, you honor your parents. You honor your parents. The duty to, while well, the duty to obey parents can end, because I don't obey my mother anymore. She asked me to eat food or she asked me to move in. I say no. Okay? The duty to obey parents stops at some point. But the duty to honor parents continues on. It never ends. It is so important that God embedded it in the Ten Commandments, the Fifth Commandment. 
the first call, the first four commandments deal with our vertical relationship with God. And the next six commandments deal with our horizontal relationship. And at the top of the horizontal relationship is our relationship with our parents. Honor your father and your mother. Exodus 20, 12. So that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. The fourth commandment is not to obey your parents, but to honor your parents. Because you have outgrown that duty to obey your parents. See, there are consequences for not honoring parents. Proverbs actually warns us not to despise or curse our parents, which is the opposite of honoring our parents. In Proverbs 23, 22, listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother when she's old. In Proverbs 20, 20, in Proverbs 20, 20, if someone curses their father and mother, their lamb will be snuffed out in pitch darkness. Proverbs 30, 17, the eye that mocks a father that scorns an aged mother will be packed out by the ravens in the there of the valley and will be eaten by vultures. That's a curse on those who dishonor their parents. And in Exodus 21, 17, after giving the Ten Commandments and after stating the fourth commandment, honor your parents, God says this in Exodus 21, 17, anyone who curses their father and mother is to be put to death. <clears throat> Mind you, the fourth commandment does not qualify the kind of parents you have. Your father and mother can be the worst mother and father mother in the world. They may have abandoned you in life. The duty, the commandment to honor parents is without qualification of what kind of parents you have. Even if they are bad parents, as a grown-up and as a believer, you must find ways to honor your parents. It's tough, I know. It's tough. You see, this is where you need to see the values you are passing on to your children. Your children see you despise your parents. One day they'll grow up despising you. But monkey see, monkey do. When they see you honoring your parents, you are passing them, you are setting them in the direction in which they would go. When they grow up, they will honor you as well, despite your failings. You see, my generation grew up in the I grew up in the 60s, where my parents worked like crazy. I hardly see my father. He was a taxi driver. He was a taxi driver and he worked the he worked the evening shift. He goes out to work at four o'clock in the afternoon and never come back until one o'clock, two in the two o'clock in the morning. I hardly see my parents, my father when I was growing up. And it is in those circumstances it's so difficult to honor your father. Because you hardly know him. And it takes a while for you to learn to honor your father, even though that generation doesn't show love in a physical way. My father would have said this. You know I love you because I work hard to give you a life. I, I work hard to provide bread on the table. Even though I don't see my head, my father. To honor our parents is to treat them as worthy. For one simple reason. They give birth to you. That's what Proverbs is saying, saying right? He, your father give you life. And that is the most important and the only reason why we honor our parents. We owe it to them. The burden is not on them. <clears throat> the burden is on us. You know, Teenagers think, sometimes think that their parents are dumb. 
the, the reality is this. Our children are more educated than we are. I'm more educated than my father. My father I do not even have a primary school education. He came from China and he has worked all his life. He didn't even go to school. I got a postgraduate degree. I'm smarter <laughs> academically than my father. And it's so easy to think that our parents are dumb. My mother is equally dumb, not having gone to school even. And don't be surprised your children think that you are dumb. Especially if you, you just have got basic degree and they are in the, in the gifted program. To be honest, I don't know how to do primary school, primary six math anymore. Really. And when I was trying to help my youngest daughter one time, she looked at me, why is my father so stupid? <laughs> don't know how to do modeling. <clears throat> Whatever you think of your parents, you still owe them the duty to honor them. <clears throat> Honor them as dumb parents, you know, according to your standard. But honor them because we are much more educated, much more exposed to the work. I was just trying to submit a, 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 an application to police force. When you hit, hit a certain age, you need to submit your medical certificate before they renew your license. And I had so hard, a hard time trying to submit. Okay. And I should have asked my daughter. I think she will do it in five minutes. I took half an hour to do a submission. I'm dumber than my children, you know. Efficient 6 1 <clears throat> combines the two of oh, obeying parents and honorary parents. Efficient 6 1 children obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. Okay. In the realm of the family, in the realm of the home, obey your parents. Then comes the second responsibility. Honor your father and the mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. And of course, verse 4, fathers do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and in the instruction of the Lord. I want to stress the fact that Ephesians 6, 4 itemize the fathers, not the mothers. You see, it is very common for the fathers to say, I leave the spiritual training of my children to the wife. But scriptures lay the responsibility on the father, not the mother. Don't abdicate that duty. Do devotion with your children if you have Young children, if you are if you are grandparent, do devotion with your grandchildren. I'm talking to the fathers and the grandfathers. Don't leave it to your mother. When I was raising children, my wife and I share the load. Sometimes she does, sometimes I do. But I will make sure that I will do it. So that this is how we obey scriptures. Fathers, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. That is father's responsibility. Okay, we move on. <clears throat> Friendship. The first sphere of our life is the home. Okay, that's the first sphere of our life. And we learn to start interacting within the home. The second sphere of our life is friendship. When your children goes to kindergarten, they make friends. Okay, when they go to primary school, they go make friends. When they go to secondary school, they make friends. And it is in the natural process of development that your child moves, that you moves in a wider circle and experience something outside the family, outside the home. And that's where friendship with the relationship with the world with your friends comes in. And that is why we must teach our children to fear the Lord in preparation for their friendship with the world. If you don't teach it correctly, they are going to follow the friends. They will not be able to choose their friends correctly. Now, according to British anthropologists, 
by the name of Robin Dunbar. If you want to, you can Google him. His Dunbar skill is very interesting. He says, this British anthropologist says that one person, a man, a person, can really only maintain about 150 friends. At most, 150 friends. That's, that's the extent of friends that you can have. You go look at you you can look at your call your 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 your, your call uh, directory phone call how many names have you got there probably 150 200 his observation is that we will have 150 relationships or connections at any one time according to him a theory called damba numbers damba numbers go google it the enormous circle only has five friends Consider in your inner circle, do you have five friends? Eh? Or do you have ten friends? His theory is that you only have five friends in the most inner circle. And the next second, the second circle, you only have 15 friends, followed by the third circle, 50 friends. So in reality, those who are close to you, you only have 20 people who are your friends. Which means that this is a select group. Which means that you need to choose carefully. Observe how your children make friends. Who are in his in that inner circle? If there are more non-Christians in that inner circle, you've got to be very careful. Because they are the one who's going to influence your children. Watch out for the inner circle of five friends and watch out for the second inner circle of 15 friends. Because they will decide whether they are going to lead your children astray or not. Proverbs has a lot to say about friends. In Proverbs 18.24, one who has unreliable friends soon come to ruin. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. <clears throat> Proverbs 13.20, Walk with the wise and become wise for a companion of who suffers harm. If you want to if, if you want to relook at your friendship this year, look into the first inner circle of your first five friends. And then look at the first, second circle of your 15 friends. Because these are the people who are going to exert influence on you. First Corinthians 15:33. Paul says, don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good character. I'm going to leave it to you to look at the rest. But Jesus did tell us that we are his friend. In John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friend. The question is, what kind of friend are you to Jesus? We know what kind of friend Jesus is to us. He loves us enough to die for us. We need to turn the question around. Is what kind of friend are you to Jesus? And then you have to decide how you're going to live your life in this realm of friendship with your friends. Finally, friendship with the world. The duty of parents is to prepare children to enter the real world. The training that your children get in the home is to prepare them to enter the world. And this world is a dangerous world of temptation and evil, of good and bad friends. When you arrive at this stage, and most of us are already in this stage of life, and when your children arrive at this stage of their life, of their life, the only thing that will guide you is your fear of the Lord. I have a God. I will disappoint my God if I do this. That's the only guideline that is going to help you navigate your relationship with the world. And that's the reason why you need to instill the fear of the Lord in your children early. 
and that's the reason why you continue to in to adapt uh, adapt and 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 cultivate your fear of the Lord. Because if you don't fear God, anything goes. We will look at two important relationships with the world. Next week, we look at our work relationship, how we interact with our work. And our third week, we'll look at how we interact with, as I said, half of humanity, women, in terms of, in terms of the sexual temptations that this world face and our relationship with our important relationship of husband and wife. That forms the core of the family, the strength of the family relationships. Two thousand and twenty three will be a challenging year. And to get through this year, you need to learn to navigate correctly. You have thirty five thousand decisions to make every day. All you need is one wrong decision out of the thirty five thousand. And your life can go down in a very bad way. We need to draw a box in which we will operate. And the box is called the fear of the Lord. Draw a rectangular box, put yourself in it, and entitle the box the fear of the Lord. Because if you don't fear the Lord, you will never make good and wise and godly decisions. You will not be able to live life that will please your heart. And when you draw this big box, the four sides of the box will keep you in. This will be the extreme perimeters, the extreme limits of your maneuverability within life. There is much freedom for us okay, to move. There is freedom in the spirit. But our freedom to decide must be dictated and guided by our fear of the Lord. Let's just pray. Father, we ask that you teach us this morning. Thank you for your grace to see us through a difficult 2022. And even as we anticipate an even more challenging year in 2023, we want to start the year right on this first day of 2023. We want to acknowledge that you are our God. We want to learn to fear you. We want to learn to trust you. We want to honor you. Help us, Father, as we cultivate and build on this fundamental relationship with you. For it is only when we fear you, then, when, then we are able and capable of facing the challenges that will hit us in 2023. We ask for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray.